This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Towards a Fresh Revolution by the Friends of Daruti Introduction, 40 Years Ago The Friends of Daruti group was formed in early 1937. Its members and supporters were prominent comrades from the Gelser battlefront. Remaining true to their anarchist beliefs, they refused to submit to the militarization and, as a result, moved to the capital of Catalonia, Barcelona, where, alongside other of Barcelona comrades, they set up the group. They took as their symbol the figure of Buenaventura de Ruti, an idealist who had devoted his whole life to his anarchist beliefs. He was a man of action, as his heroic death on the Madrid front testifies. That heroic and timeless Madrid, which lives on in the spontaneous catchphrase which the Republic's governments fight for that city drew from the capital's inhabitants. Viva Madrid sin gobierno! Long live Madrid without government. This indomitable spirit of the people of Madrid lasted throughout the entire siege of the capital. And it was this spirit that the group adopted as its own. Thus it was that the fighting men from Gelsa, with the Daruti column on the Aragon front, became the heralds of the message, Stand fast and fight to the last. These were virtues which no one can deny that Daruti, the anarchist from Lyon, did have. At his funeral, Barcelona paid him the tribute of one of the largest popular demonstrations ever as the Catalan proletariat took to the streets as a body to pay homage to the man who had given his life for the cause of the disinherited the world over. Having given a rough outline of the nature of our group, I shall now proceed to a short introduction to our pamphlet, Hacia una nueva revolución, Towards a Fresh Revolution. First of all, when was it written? Around mid-1938. But it must be emphasised that for us to write a booklet of this sort, with the title we gave it, at that tragic hour for the Spanish proletariat, was a highly suggestive action, amounting to a cry of hope to the fighters of Spain. Notwithstanding their heroism and tenacity, they found themselves surrounded by the most fearful defeat on account of their failure to crush the counter-revolution led by the Stalinists, who were backed by the camouflaged reformists inside the National Confederation of Labour, CNT, and Iberian Anarchist Federation, FAI, and all who were established in the upper echelons of the state. The time was 1938, 40 years ago, at a point when the war was a lost cause, and when war fronts were collapsing, one after another, as a result of the treachery of Stalinists in key positions in the decision-making process, obeying Stalin's orders to undermine the Spanish proletariat in arms, such was the tragic hour when we of the Friends of Daruti group, at the group's last session after prolonged examination of the disaster which the counter-revolution had plunged us, and regardless of the scale of the disaster, refused to accept the finality of such defeat. The infamous policy pursued by Largo Caballero, whose government contained several anarchist militants, had eroded the revolutionary morale of the rearguard, and the Negrin government, the government of defeat or capitulation, gave the defeat hecatomb proportions. For this reason, we decided to publish Asia una nueva revolución, which was, as we said, a message of hope and a determination to renew the fight against an international capitalism which had mobilized its gendarmes of the 30s. In other words, its black shirts and brown shirts, to put down the Spanish working class at whose head marched the anarchists and the revolutionary rank and file of the National Confederation of Labour. In the prelude to July, we can discern the Spain the Spanish proletariat tried to destroy, the theocratic black Spain ruled by large landowners who had surrendered the economy of the country to foreign powers. This age-old battle was constantly contested from the 15th century up to 1936, setting liberty against tyranny, progress against obscurantism. Ever present in this age-old contest were anarchism and the National Confederation of Labour, 
whose militants were the targets of savage repression under the monarchy of Alfonso XIII, the grandfather of Juan Carlos, the present monarch imposed upon the Spanish people by international capitalism. This imposition can be accounted for by the terror that the revolutionary Spain inspires in all the interconnected capitalist forces, on account of its sublime gesture of three years of rebellion in the 30s. Hence the fear felt by the Washington-Moscow axis and the Bonn-Paris-London triangle. Forty years later, the importance of what we wrote in those hours, fraught with compassion and grief, is revealed. If, in the 30s, the Spanish proletariat threw itself into the prodigious fray, though outgunned and with its battlefronts and its rearguard undermined by the hybrid, murderous policy of the communists, today the Spanish proletariat once again launches itself into the great adventure of revolution. There are hopeful signs in the form of a magnificent younger generation forged in the jails, who have equipped themselves through reference to books, particularly those written by revolutionaries who stood firm against the tidal wave of counter-revolution, and in matters of theory, they may be better equipped than the men of July 1936, who are awestruck by the grandeur of social revolution that dawned so gloriously over Iberian soil, and which, had it but been given proper expression, would have become the first sage of European, and thence, worldwide revolution. In that booklet, back in 1938, we said that all revolutions are totalitarian. They must be interpreted and must express themselves in the sense that all revolutions are integral. That is to say, they cannot be made halves nor tackled side on without the great edifice of revolution coming face to face with destruction. It is terrible when one thinks of the way in which revolutions come to grief. The Spanish Revolution was doomed to perish from the instant the revolutionary spirit and the war were divorced. Take, for example, the decree of the militarization of the militias. With regard to the state structure, there was no way the Spanish Revolution could survive. The defense committees, control patrols, and the collectives were dissolved. This was the build-up to the sudden assault by the Catalan proletariat in May 1937, when the workers tried to win back the gains they had made in July. The May events are described in our pamphlet. The lesson of May is unmistakable. Revolutions cannot restrict themselves to the confines of their native land. A new Spanish revolution must, if it is to succeed, assume European proportions. Today's Europe is sitting on the edge of a volcano. Faithful to our message of 1938, we shall go on fighting for a new and European revolution, just as the Spanish Revolution of 1936 and the Portuguese Revolution of 1974 must be labelled European. Both suffered from the same shortcoming. They left the state intact, and in both cases, pseudo-revolutionaries repaired the state structures when they were coming apart on all sides. Europe's workers must help out the Spanish proletariat with the fight against international capitalism, which has already been launched on our soil. Europe's solidarity is indispensable if the monarchy imposed upon the Spanish people by international capitalism is to be overthrown. Once again, proletarian Spain will serve as the catalyst for proletarian Europe, if we establish a close alliance with the Spanish revolutionary workers to counteract the capitalist siege, which has the collusion of both socialists and communists. The transcendent impact of the Spanish Revolution of 1936, which would have begun a cycle of European revolutions of necessity, terrified the capitalist magnates who saw in it the overture to extension throughout the continent and thus massacred the Spanish people. We have indicated the causes of the defeat, but we want to stress the need to prepare an authentic proletarian internationalism, which must show itself in the creation of a powerful and European libertarian movement. Let our one hope and hesitation be that the libertarian spirit of the young Europeans of this Europe, which is only a step away from fascism, does not come to naught. The new Spanish Revolution is taking shape. All that remains to be done is to organise the mobilisation of all European revolutionaries around Spain, which has not, even for an instant, and in spite of the terrible bloodbath which international capitalism inflicted on it during the 30s and the years of terror in the 40s and under the present monarchy, failed to declare itself. 
The monarchy is the creature of the lackeys of the Bonn Paris axis, and of the hirelings of the US gendarme, not forgetting the tacit acquiescence of the USSR. Jaime Balius, 1978, The Friends of Duruti. Overture to the Spanish Revolution Political rotation, which in Spain took the form of constitutionalists and absolutionists alternating in power, the Classico Terno, collapsed beyond repair with a coup d'etat mounted in the capital of Catalonia by a drunken, cantankerous general in the year 1923. The dictatorship of Primo de Rivera is the direct outcome of politics pursued amid maladministration, monopolies, bureaucratic perks, rake-offs, concessions, and a whole mass of profiteering operated with the blessing of officialdom. The military reaction of 1923 was a direct result of one of the reasons why our country is impoverished, one which has absorbed nearly the whole national budget. Spain's colonial power spawned a rogues gallery of adventurers, mercenaries, professional politicians, and a cohort of dealers in cheap flesh. As long as the bureaucracy of the Sabre and the captains of industry had plenty of scope to plunder and loot in the overseas possessions, then Spain as such could go on her way, more or less unaffected. But colonial disaster held the key to the collapse of this situation, which was maintained by an unscrupulous, ruthless minority. At the close of the 19th century, the military were deprived of the spoils they craved, they had no option but to return to the peninsula, braid saturated in blood, bearing the shame of beings inept even in their own profession, that of bearing arms. From that moment forward, the Spanish people had been confronted by a problem fraught with difficulties. Thousands of these protégés of a syphilitic king returned to devour the natives of the mother country, since they no longer had the opportunity to go on impoverishing the people of the colonies, who cursed Spain's representatives as thieves and assassins in general sashes and chevrons. The public exchequer stood in need of an immediate outlet. The Algeciras conference laid the borders of Morocco open to attack. The mines of the reef, coveted by the Count of the Romanones, became an abyss, demanding the blood and the money of the Spanish people. One billion pesetas the Moroccan venture has cost the nation's exchequer, plus many thousands of lives sacrificed to the financial cartel represented by the farmer Count of Romanones. The most startling points in the Spanish slaughter, revolving around the iron deposits in the tribal territory of Beni Bu Ifrur, near the mountain of Aflatan, are the tragedies of Barranco de Lobo and Anual. The military have ever been a millstone around the neck of the working people. Look at the defence juntas, of evil memory. The moving spirit behind them, Colonel Marquez, tried to infuse them with a liberal outlook, but Las Siervas' patronage intrigues far outweighed the transitory goodwill of a colonel who ended up persecuted and imprisoned in Monjuic. General Primo de Rivera was the incarnation of this whole past we have mentioned. Thanks to the strength of Lopez Ochoa, and with the passive help of the bourgeoisie, the latter fundists, the clergy, and the financiers, he brandished his sword from the lofty heights of power. There is written proof that this former Captain General of Catalonia entered the fray for the purpose of cancelling out the Picasso inquiry's findings, in which Alfonso XIII and his man of straw Sylvester the General were directly implicated. This interpretation of the facts is undoubtedly well-founded, but what precipitated the military's move was unquestionably the disquiet among the working classes. Having had its fill of outrage and systematic thievery, the working class was preparing to banish those responsible for its misfortune from Spanish soil. The financial and industrial bourgeoisie placed all their resources at the disposal of the army. They restricted credit, sabotaged the economy, applied the lockout and provoked strikes. Great displays of rejoicing from the Catalan bourgeoisie greeted the army's Polish-style dictatorship. The Primo de Rivera era 
must be categorized as an effort by the ruling class to weaken the working class, whose actions were to take on a more positive form at a later date. This reprisal was an updated, more comprehensive reenactment of the past, with the same moral turpitude and eternal arrogance that have martyrized the corpse of a Spain that is ever noble in its rags. This philandering general was replaced by Beringer, who was himself supplanted by Ethnar. And to top it all, it was the Count of Romanones, an agent of the intelligence service, who supervised the transfer of power from the monarchy to his former secretary, Don Niceto Alcala Zamora. He, along with the son of Maura, and with the assistance of Maranon, the palace physician and also of the intelligence service, laid the foundations for a republic which was bound to end in the most frightful stench. The new republic was completely unpopular. Instead of following socialist guidelines forged in the clamour of the streets, the same parasites as in the days of the Bourbons hold sway. Power is in the hands of politicians who were good servants of the monarchy. Alcala Zamora was a recalcitrant monarchist, a representative of the clergy and latter fundists. Azania once belonged to the party of Melquiades Alvarez, Miguel Maura, another royalist, Alejandro Lurú, a man without honour. Disconsolate Spain took the path of betrayals, of useless secret meetings. April's comedy was to be paid for with torrents of blood. What with the April Republic was to bring forth was catastrophe. Son of Ferreira's murderer, author of 108 deaths, the minister who gave the order to fire at will, turned our countryside into a network of funeral crosses. Seeing their hopes violently crushed, the working masses turned angrily against the April fiasco. Miguel Maura mobilized the armed forces of his brand new republic to crush and destroy the workers. Pasaje Sarnero, Castil Blanco, Seville, Catalunya, all describe the true nature of the republic that exiles the monarch but with his monies intact, and conveys him in a ship of the line. Alfonso XIII's family shook hands warmly with General Sanjurjo in August 1932 and again in July 1936. The general unleashed attacks on a people betrayed by politicians who had given the general a free hand. He was an assassin with a royalist background. According to reports, the Count of Romanones said in the station at El Escorial, Hasta muy pronto! Until we meet again very soon. The Republic prattled on in an endless exchange of views. The constituent Cortes came up with no solution to any problem. The question of the army, which only execution pickets could resolve, turned into farce. Azania allowed the military to retire under such exceptional terms that the effort was an enormous upsurge in the non-productive population, whilst the barracks were handed over to the monarchist officer class. Likewise, the religious issue was sidestepped. The church should have been expropriated without compensation, not to mention the provision for religion and clerics being eliminated from the nation's budget. This was not done. Instead, the religious orders were legalized, and the droves who seek refuge in 300 religious orders and 6,000 conventos, male and female convents, were given citizenship rights. There was no attempt to eradicate this cancer that has eaten away at the Spanish soul for so many centuries. The Mendizabal administration achieved more than this republic even though the latter had the benefit of an extra hundred years experience. And they failed to confiscate the five billion pesetas worth of Jesuit investment in the nation's economy. A solution was not found to the problem of finances. The debts and commitments of the monarchy were acknowledged. The budget rocketed, non-productive classes expanded, and the bureaucracy underwent tremendous growth. The public debt, standing at 3 billion pesetas in 1814, grew phenomenally with the colonial losses and the Moroccan disaster, experiencing a slight deflation at the moment of Via Verde, reaching the astronomical sum of 22 billion in the time of the April Republic. April 14th brought protection to the rentier 
and oppression to the customer. The tax on rent was quite merciless. The policy being applied was plainly a bourgeois one, even if the socialists were in power. Monopolies remained the order of the day, with the smuggler, March, evading jail as and when he pleased. Nor was the problem of the statutes any more satisfactorily resolved. There may be talk of one of the articles of the Constitution, of a federal or federative republic, but for all that talk, centralism still prevails. The agrarian problem ended in fiasco. The Institute for Agrarian Reform was a hotbed of nepotism. 5,000 peasants were to be settled each year. Some 5 million needed land. With this laughably optimistic policy of reform, the end might have been in sight in after a thousand years. They came to the labour question armed with a horrendous jargon. Workers' control consisted of such delegation of power as friendship and favouritism might allow. Spain's colonial status became an issue with the Telefonica affair. So, in spite of all Prieto's bravado, and the fact that he labelled the Telefonica contract one-sided in a debate in the Ateneo in Madrid, and it was better the Telefonica workers be machine-gunned whenever they took to the streets to demand to adjust wage rise, rather than the North American capital be shored up. We have lived through two biennia, the red and the black. During both, the working class were persecuted in dastardly fashion. The socialists operated as the lackeys of capitalism. The laws for the defence of the Republic for public order and the law of April 8th are wholly repressive in their nature. The right uses them as it chooses. The workers' reaction can be seen in the burning of the conventos, in the events of Barcelona and Figols on January 8th and December 3rd. Deportations to Bata and Via Cisneros were still more steps towards surrendering the Republic to the proletariat's eternal enemies. Both biennia were filled with tragedy. Responsibility for the rights occupying a do dominant position must be borne by the social democracy. And it is their fault if the revolution has not been able to escape foreign intervention. In April 1931, the Italian fascists had not extricated themselves from the thorn of Adonna, and the Hitlerites not yet managed to erect a nationalistic, totalitarian state. Circumstances were favourable, but treachery by the socialists and reformism from Pastana and his acolytes prevented the moment of truth, which was later to cost even more dearly from arriving. Out of this ill-assorted hodgepodge of situations surged October. The overture to July was born in the Asturias. There the struggle was pursued with courage and ferocity. Inside Catalonia, Dencas set himself the task of alienating the working class from that revolt, which could have been crucial. All the socialists wanted to do in October was to prevent Alcala Zamora from handing over to the right, in the same way as they had frightened him before with their strikes. Had they desired revolution, they would have exploited the peasant revolt of June 1934, or even timed it to coordinate city with countryside. But the socialists were swept aside by the working class. The Larue Gil Robles government lasted two years, two black years of repression and imprisonment, culminating in the Free the Prisoners elections, Elecciones Propresos, which bore fruit in the events of July. The tragedy of Spain knows no end. The most vivid pens fail to describe the tragedy of a people whose bodies and minds are scarred by past and present horrors. Our writers cannot accurately reflect the cavalry of a race that appears to have been born to suffer. In February 1936, the sad picture of this Spanish scene was at its blackest. On that date, Spain was one vast detention camp. Thousands of workers were behind bars. We stand on the eve of July. We must call to mind the events that paved the way for the army rebellion. The policies of the Black Biennium were bankrupt. Gil Robles had not slaked the appetites of his followers. A conflict had arisen between Alcala Zamora and the chief of popular action. The Jesuits were supporting the president of the Republic. He was their new hope. Not for nothing had he raised the banner for constitutional reform and religion. How long the Cortes would last was uncertain. 
the radicals had broken away from the writer's block, feeling quite estranged from the heart of the nation. Stormy sittings matched a policy that was base, repugnant, and criminal in its crudity. The proletariat was beginning to make itself in a more befitting manner. Monster rallies held in the stadium in Madrid, in Barcelona, and in Valencia commanded huge crowds. That these exhibitions of determination and the spirit of revolt served to renew the credibility of an old reactionary figure such as Azania is something to be regretted. It was an error which would have to be paid for later on with interest. Alcala Zamora thought he was in control of the situation. The Cortes was dissolved. Franco, Godet, Cabaneas, Gaypa de Llano, Mola, these were Zamora's puppets. He chose a financier bandit, one Portela Valladares, to carry his plan into effect. The resources of the state failed the Galician cacique. In spite of electoral malpractice and the ministry's list of approved candidates, the results of the February elections failed to set the Holy See's mind at rest. Finding his plans frustrated, Alcala Zamora urged Portela to proclaim a state of emergency. Portela did not dare. He realized that the people of Spain were on the streets and recommended that Azania be sent for. He was right. The politician from the Red Biennium was to be a temporary sedative. That was precisely what the reactionaries were after at that point. A breathing space during which to put the final touches to preparations for the revolt by the generals who frequented the Plaza de Oriente. The successful elections of February failed to open the eyes of the socialists. The monster rallies to protest against the numbers imprisoned, the enthusiasm for the release of the prisoners taken during the great drama of October, all this suggested nothing new to them. They stuck to their old ways, a new Cortes, a fresh election for the presidency of the Republic. They kept Alcala Zamora's plans and his scheme for handing control over to the military and not to the people. But the proletariat had learned the harsh lesson of the two biennia they had lived through. They dashed headlong into the streets. Firebrands set religious centers ablaze. The clamor from the imprisoned defied their walls. City and country were equally aroused. The ignorance of the social democrats postponed the outburst by the people. Fortunately, after five months, the rightists' lack of sophistication and their failure to appreciate the counter-revolutionary roles of Azania and Prieto brought the issue onto the streets. There was sporadic violence from February to July. Yet again, workers' blood was spilled. The strike by the building unions in Madrid and a clash in Malaga exposed the cretinism of the February politicians. Boldly, the right mobilized for an attack on the situation emerging from the emotion-filled elections. Fascists killed the coward's way, arousing hatred by their surprise attacks. There was a vague feeling that the Black Spain was planning something. The talk was persistently of army mutiny. There was no doubt. The proletariat was setting out along the road to July. The government took a back seat. Faced with a choice between fascism and the proletariat, they opted for the former. To cover his tracks, number one traitor Casares Quiroga would threaten the rightists from the government benches, inciting them to take to the streets. Calvo Sotelo's murderer brought things to a head. When a rumour had it that the army would be invading the streets at any moment, the rumours seemed probably true. But did those in government take any preventative measures? Franco is in command in the Canaries, Godet in the Balearics, Mola in Navarre, why was the whole bunch not dismissed? The fascists could also rely on powerful allies in government circles. On July 17th, that nemesis we had been warding off for some time unmasked itself. In the Balearics, in Morocco, in the Canaries, the officers were in open revolt. What was done to bring the rebellion to an abrupt halt? What did the government of that scum Casares Quiroga do? Shut itself up in complete inertia concealed the gravity of the situation from the people, imposed a rigorous censorship, refused weapons to the proletariat. There was still time, between July 17th and July 19th, to compel the militarists to capitulate. But a highly suspect, suicidal attitude prevailed. Casares Quiroga is Mola's accomplice. He kept him on in Pamplona, 
even after he had proclaimed himself openly in revolt against the results of the February elections, and regardless of the protection he was extending to all the conspirators on the right. The treachery by the left is obvious. No arms were given to the people, because the bourgeois democrats were afraid of the proletariat. In Zaragoza, the attitude of Governor Vera Coronel, who prevaricated with the workers' representatives in negotiations, helped the fascists to victory. And in Valencia, when all of Spain was already plunged into fighting, the rebels were allowed to remain in their barracks. At this historic, blood-soaked hour, it is not with mealy mouths that we charge those Republican politicians who acted openly in favour of fascism out of their fear of the working class. We accuse Azania, Casares, Quiroga, Companis, and the Socialists, all the farsias from the Republic which, built on the one-act sketch in April, has laid waste to the homes of the working class. And this is happening because of the failure to make the revolution at the correct time. The people had to go and look for weapons. They took them by right of conquest, gained them by their own exertions. They were given nothing, not by the government of the Republic, not by the Generalitat. Not one rifle. On July 19th, as on the other great occasions before the proletariat took up its positions in the streets, for some days it had been keeping a close vigil on the streets of every settlement in Spain. In the capital city of Catalonia, memories of glorious past struggles were being conjured up. The first weapons were seized by workers from some supply ships lying at anchor in the port of Barcelona, the Manuel Arnas and the Marques de Comillas. As dawn broke on July 19th, the militarists surged onto the streets, facing an attack from the Catalan people, who stormed barracks and fought on until the last fascist redoubt had been taken. The Catalan proletariat saved the proletariat of Spain from fascism. Proletarian Catalonia became a beacon, shedding its light all over Spain. No matter that the agrarian regions of Spain are in fascist hands, we, the workers of the industrial zones, will redeem our comrades from the captivity which has befallen them. In Madrid, the pattern was the same. No arms were distributed there either. They were won in the streets. The proletariat fought and stormed the Montaña barracks, overwhelming the soldiery. And then, with shotguns and whatever else they could get their hands on, the workers set out for the Sierra de Guadarrama to cut off the advance of General Muller. With the Navarra brigades behind him, he was preparing to conquer the capital city of Castile. Fascism was routed in the north, in Levant, and in a number of places in Aragon, Andalusia, and Extremadura. But elsewhere in the peninsula, the workers were disarmed and had to contend with leftist governors who eased the way for Spanish fascists. Casares Quiroga made way for a government under Martinez Barrio. This politician, who torpedoed the April constituent Cortes, was coming into power in order to reach an understanding with the fascists and hand power over to them. Swift reflex action by the working class aborted one of the most infamous acts of treachery ever conceived. If this treachery was never implemented, it was only for lack of time. The politicians, beginning with Azania, must pay for this vile manoeuvre with their heads. This initially pessimistic outlook and the suggestion of surrender circulating in official circles were cancelled out by the ferocity of the proletariat. Giral replaced Martinez Barrio. We have presented an anecdotal outline of how events developed, but it behooves us to dwell a little longer on July and to examine what sort of revolution was achieved during those days of glory. There has been a lot of theorising about July, the bourgeois democrats and Marxists insist that the popular explosion in July must be classified as a legitimate act of self-defence by a proletariat which saw itself under attack from its worst enemy. Taking this as their base thesis, the argument then is that July cannot be deemed as a typical revolutionary class phenomenon. This thesis from our opponents is a fallacy. Revolutions do break out unforeseen but they are always preceded by a long period of gestation. April opened one era and closed another. And right in the foreground of the April era, and still there today, the working class continues to occupy the advanced positions of the revolution. Had it not surged headlong onto the streets in July, the proletariat would have done so at some other point. 
but it would not have desisted from its noble undertaking to free itself of the bourgeois yoke. From the petty bourgeoisie comes an allegation that we were, all of us, all shades of opinion, out in the streets. But we must remind them that, but for the Senete and Fai rushing to where danger were greatest, there would have been a repeat performance of the comic opera in Barcelona in October. In Catalonia, the organized workers in the Senete predominate. If there are any who deny that, it is through ignorance or an attempt to ignore the history of the Senete on Catalan soil. The July Revolution drew its impetus from the workers, and as such, was a class revolution. On the streets, and at a theoretical level, all that the petit bourgeoisie did was to act as an afterthought, nothing more. But there are other, equally important considerations, perhaps more so. The memory of the political conditions which capitalism caused in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries has grown vague. What is more, petit bourgeois democratic illusions on what earlier bids, like 1873 or April, brought about have been shattered. After February, the only type of revolution possible in Spain was social revolution, such as that which blazed with such splendor in July. April was decisive. It was enough to prevent our falling into the same error, by which we do not mean only the repression of which we were targets. We shall confine ourselves solely to the nonsensical argument put forward by the Marxists. How do we account for the fact that in the July Revolution we saw a repetition of the errors we had criticized hundreds and hundreds of times? How come we did not hold out for social revolution in July? How come workers' organizations failed to assume maximum control of the country? The vast majority of the working population stood by the CNT. Inside Catalonia, the CNT was the majority organization. What happened that the CNT did not make its revolution? the people's revolution, the revolution of the majority of the population. What happened was what had to happen. The Senate was utterly devoid of revolutionary theory. We did not have a concrete program. We had no idea where we were going. We had lyricism aplenty, but when all this said and done, we did not know what to do with our masses of workers or how to give substance to the popular effusion which erupted inside our organizations. By not knowing what to do, we handed the revolution on a platter to the bourgeoisie and the Marxists who support the farce of yesteryear. What is worse, we allowed the bourgeoisie a breathing space to return, to reform, and to behave as would a conqueror. The CNT did not know how to live up to its role. It did not want to push ahead with the revolution with all its consequences. They were frightened by the foreign fleets, claiming that Barcelona would come under fire from ships of the English fleet. Has any revolution ever been made without having to overcome countless difficulties? Is there any revolution in the world of the advanced type that has been able to avert foreign intervention? Using fear as a springboard and letting oneself be swayed by timidity, one never succeeds. Only the bold, the resolute men of courage may attain great victories. The timid have no right to lead the masses. When an organization's whole existence has been spent preaching revolution, it has an obligation to act whenever a favorable set of circumstances arises. And in July, the occasion did present itself. The CNT ought to have leapt into the driver's seat in the country, delivering a severe coup de grace to all that is outmoded and archaic. In this way, we would have won the war and saved the revolution. But it did the opposite. It collaborated with the bourgeoisie in the affairs of the state, precisely when the state was crumbling away on all sides. It bolstered up companies and company. It breathed a lungful of oxygen into an anemic, terror-stricken bourgeoisie. One of the most direct reasons why the revolution has been asphyxiated and the Senate displaced is that it behaved like a minority group, even though it had a majority in the streets. With this minority outlook, the Senate has not been able to make its plans prevail. It has found itself continually sabotaged and trapped in the web of a confused, deceitful policy. Inside the Generalitat, as well as the town council, we had fewer votes than other groups, even though we had far more members. And what's more, we were the ones who conquered the streets. Why have we given them up so crassly? 
On the other hand, we would assert that revolutions are totalitarian, no matter who says otherwise. What happens is that the various aspects of revolution are progressively dealt with, but with the proviso that the class which represents the new order of things is the one with most responsibility. And when things are done by halves, we have what presently concerns us, the disaster of July. In July, a committee of anti-fascist militias was set up. It was not a class organ. Bourgeois and counter-revolutionary factions had their representatives on it. It looked as if this committee had been set up as a counterbalance to the Generalitat. But it was all a sham. Control patrols were organized. They were men of the barricades, men of the streets. Factories, workshops and businesses were taken over and the latter fundists tackled. Defense committees and supply committees were established in each locality and municipality. Sixteen months have rolled past. What remains? Of the spirit of July, only a memory. Of the organisms of July, a yesterday. But the machinery of politics and the petty bourgeoisie lingers on intact. The undergrowth of some sectors, maintained solely by the backs of the workers, lingers on in the Plaza de la Repubblica in the Catalan capital. May 3rd. It has been inside the barracks of Catalonia that counter-revolution has made its greatest efforts to crush the essentials of the Ju July Revolution. The economic structure of Catalonia allowed for great masses of workers, educated to class consciousness in the atmosphere of factory and workshop, to be concentrated. This peculiar feature of the centres of manufacture is extremely favourable to the attainment of the end of the revolution. In July, Catalonia's working people placed social life on a fresh basis. There was a resurgence by an indomitable proletariat, with the critical equipment of long years of struggle within the ranks of the Confederation. Social revolution could have been a fact in Catalonia. Furthermore, this revolutionary proletariat could have served as a counterweight to a bureaucratic reformist Madrid and the influence of the Catholic Basque country. But the events took a different turn. The revolution was not made in Catalonia. Realising that, once again, the proletariat was saddled with a leadership of quibblers, the petty bourgeoisie, which had gone into hiding in the back rooms in July, hastened to join the battle. The shocking feature of when we speak of the middle class is that we have to refer to Marxists, who have been inundated by shopkeepers and the YIGAS 120,000 votes. In Catalonia, socialism has been a pitiful creature. Its ranks have been swelled by members opposed to revolution. It has captained the counter-revolution. It has spawned a UGT, which has been turned into an appendage of the GEPCI. Marxist leaders have sung the praises of counter-revolution. They have sculpted slogans about the issue of a united front, whilst first eliminating the PUM, then trying to repeat the operation with the CNT. The manoeuvres of the petit bourgeoisie, in alliance with the socialists and communists, culminated in the events of May. There have been conflicting versions of just what happened in May. But the truth of the matter is that the counter-revolution wanted the working class on the streets in a disorganised manner, so that it might be crushed. They partially attained their objectives, thanks to the stupidity of some leaders who gave the ceasefire order and dubbed the Friends of Deruti agents provocateurs just when the streets had been won and the enemy eliminated. Self-evidently, the counter-revolution has an interest in control of public order, passing under the supervision of the Valencia government. They succeeded in that, thanks to Largo Caballero. It is worth noting that at this time the Senate had four ministers in the cabinet. It has also been pointed out that the petit bourgeoisie, providing for a foreign intervention on the pretext of disorder breaking out, that foreign flotilla would sail for Barcelona was a certainty. And there has been talk of motorized divisions of the French army on the verge of intervening in frontier posts to which we might add the conspiratorial work of politicians meeting in the French capital. The atmosphere had become very tense. Senete membership cards were being torn up. Senete and Fai militias were being disarmed. There were continuous clashes which only by the merest chance did not turn out to have more serious consequences. The provocations that we workers had to put up with were manifold. 
the threats from the Descocracy came out into the open, naked and unashamed. The death of a socialist militant, Roldan, was exploited as the pretext for a monster display of strength in which all the counter-revolutionary crew took part. Everything that went wrong was blamed on the CNT. Anarchists were blamed for every misfortune. Food shortages were laid at the door of the supply committees. The explosion came on the 3rd of May. With the cognizance of Aiguade, Rodriguez Salas, Commissar for Public Order, headed a unit of assault guards and burst into the telephone exchange. They tried to disarm the CNT comrades, even though the exchange was under joint control of the CNT and UGT. This move by Rodriguez Salas, who belongs to the PSUC, was a call to arms. Within a few hours, barricades had gone up in all the streets in Barcelona. The crackle of rifle fire and the rattle of machine guns could be heard and the air was filled with the sounds of cannon salvos and the reports of bombs. At the end of a few hours, the tide had turned in the favour of the proletarians enrolled in the CNT, who, as they had in July, defended their rights with guns in hand. We took the streets. They were ours. There was no power on earth that could have wrestled them from us. Working class areas fell to us quickly. Then the enemy's territory was eaten away, little by little, to a redoubt in a section of the residential area, the city centre, which would have fallen soon, but for the defection of the CNT committees. Realising the indecision that showed itself in the fighting, and the lack of leadership and organisation evident in the street, our grouping issued a leaflet followed by a manifesto. They labelled us as agent provocateurs, because we demanded that provocateurs be shot, that the armed forces be disbanded, that political parties who had armed the provocation be suppressed, and also that a revolutionary junta be established to press on with the socialization of the economy and to claim all economic power for the unions. Our analysis, as set out in those moments of tension in both leaflet and manifesto, insisted that the barricades should not be abandoned on condicio ally, since that would be the first time in history when a victorious army had yielded ground to the enemy. Guarantees were needed that we would not be persecuted. But the chieftains of the CNT gave assurances that the organization's representatives in the Generalitat would look out for the working class. Nonetheless, the second part of what had come to pass hours earlier in Valencia emerged. The barricades were abandoned, without our having good reason to do so. As the Catalan scene was returning to calm, the excesses perpetrated by the Marxists and the public forces came to light. We had been right. Comrade Berneri was snatched from his home and shot to death in the middle of the street. Thirty comrades were discovered, horribly mutilated in Sardinola. Comrade Martinez of the Libertarian Youth lost his life in a manner unknown in the private dungeons of the Cheka, and a large number of comrades from the CNT in Fai were brutally murdered. We must remember that Professor Berneri was a learned Italian comrade from that anti-fascist Italy filling the deportation islands, the cemeteries, and the concentration camps. Like his anti-fascist comrades, he could not stay in Mussolini's Italy. The murders were followed by a wave of intense repression. Comrades were arrested in connection with the events in July and May. There were attacks on unions, collectives and offices of the Friends of Deruti, the Libertarian Youth, and the Poom. One event we cannot pass over, the disappearance and death of Andres Nin. More than half a year has elapsed now, and the government has yet to clear up the so-called mystery surrounding Nin's murder. Shall we one day know who killed him? After May, the counter-revolution felt stronger than ever. Foreign powers lent assistance to this reaction by the Descocracy. Within a few days, the Negrin government had been formed, with two ends behind its establishment. The annihilation of the revolutionary section of the proletariat, and preparation for an abrazo de Vergara. Meanwhile, in Catalonia, a government composed of secretaries from the political parties and union organizations was set up, until Luis Companys ousted the CNT representatives from the Generalitat. What took place in May was quite different from what happened in July. In May, the proletariat fought with what was self-evidently a class spirit. There could be no doubt that the working class wanted to radicalize the revolution. 
However much the reactionary press may try to obscure the nature of May, it will go down in history as a sudden and well-timed blow aimed by the proletariat. Feeling that the revolution was threatened, they came onto the streets to save and revitalize it. In May, we were in time to save the revolution. Many perhaps regret having heeded the call for a ceasefire in those historic moments, and are pained at the sights of jails crammed with workers. The Friends of Duruti Group did its duty. We were the only ones equal to the challenge of the circumstances. We could foresee the outcome. May can never be forgotten. It was the loudest knock the working class has delivered on the portals of the bourgeoisie. Whenever they come to speak of the events in May, historians will have to pay homage to the Catalan proletariat, who laid down the yardstick for the new era, which must be 100% proletarian. Spain's independence. Intervention by foreign powers in the Spanish scene has brought into focus the eternal dilemma in which our country has always found itself. Since the 16th century, Spain's political life has been a lien of foreign powers. Two dynasties, one Austrian, the other Bourbon, not to mention the short reign of Amadio of Savoy, kept the people of Spain in subjugation up to April 14th, 1931. Spain's independence has always been a fiction. The Foreign Office and the Calle de Orce have played a most important role in our decisions. Remember the pardoning of San Jorge after his rebellion in August 1932, granted only after pressure from the French government? The Spanish economy, a preeminently agrarian one, has kept us tied to the apron strings of the big industrial powers. In order to export our produce, we've been obliged to buy machinery we could have made at home. And in return for London taking our oranges, we are urged to buy English coal, with the inevitable result that the working day in our coal mines is reduced because of the slump in production at home. We export iron, copper, and other min minerals in order to buy the finished machinery, built by the very country that bought its raw materials from us. Our subsoil is extremely rich, but foreign capital owns it. Our country is gripped by the tentacles of international finance, which devours the people's wealth. Spanish workers have always sweated in order to satisfy the dividends and substantial profits of foreign stockholders and financiers. From the dawn of our history, a spirit of independence has been evident in Spaniards. Invasions have been numerous, but they never managed to extinguish the sacred flame of independence. When we come to the current invasion, it is clearly of a nature that contrasts with the earlier ones, in that in the case of the Iberians, Phoenicians, Carthaginians, Romans, Arabs, or French, there was no social dimension. During the Napoleonic invasions, liberals and absolutists stood shoulder to shoulder in the fray. El Empicinado found Father Marino on his side, though only through force of circumstance. During the expedition of the Duke of Angoulême, authorized by the Holy Alliance from Vienna, opinion in the peninsula was noticeably divided. Father Marino sided with the invaders. El Empicinado, for his part, resisted the entry of the foreign forces. What is happening today is a reenactment of what happened in the reign of Ferdinand VII. Once again in Vienna, there has been a conference of fascist dictators for the purpose of organizing their invasion of Spain, and the workers in arms have taken up the mantle of El Empecinado. Germany and Italy need raw materials. They need iron, copper, lead, and mercury. But these Spanish mineral deposits are the preserve of France and England. Yet, even though Spain faces subjection, England does not protest. On the contrary, in a vile maneuver, she tries to negotiate with Franco, since the war began, she has helped blockade ports held by us. Fascist shipping unload war materials at fascist-controlled ports and take on ore, livestock, oil. International fascism needs food for its machine. Hitler's slogan, more guns, less butlers, and Mussolini's autarky lead them to sack the agricultural regions under the iron rule of the rebel generals. In economic matters, we have always been dependent on other countries. Commercial treaties and the balance of payments have never operated in our favour. 
this trend has been a nightmare for our economy. Spain's problem is a colonial one. Capitalism, having extinguished feudalism in its own territory, finds itself in the incongruous position of having to bolster feudal regimes in the countries it seeks to exploit. This goes for Spain, as it does likewise for China. It is up to the working class to ensure Spain's independence. Native capitalism will not do it, since the international capital crosses all frontiers. This is Spain's current predicament. It is up to us workers to root out the foreign capitalists. Patriotism does not enter into it. It is a matter of class interests. As the international intrigues go on, it is safe to assume that England will manage to settle the Spanish question on the basis of an ignominious status quo. Will she make economic concessions to Germany and Italy? Will partial rights to our subsoil resources be hived off to foreign powers? Will Spain be partitioned? England is interested in our mineral wealth. Such is the colossal pressure of a fascism spread throughout the world, and partly to the famous anti comintern pact, that, at best, perfidious Albion will yield, always provided that there is no threat to the free passage of her shipping through the Mare Nostrum. It is hard to guess what will happen. We must put no trust in the League of Nations, nor in the host of committees and subcommittees nor in conferences whose only purpose, like the Neon Conference, is to waste time on the matter. But it is worth noting that the English Conservatives have recalled Lord Halifax, the author of the massacres in India. There can be only one question for us. Will France be ready to place in the balance not only her maritime, but also her territorial security? Will France keep to the non-intervention policy hammered out by Leon Blum? Is she prepared to renounce her colonial army? Let us trust no one. Salvation lies in our own hands. Foreign powers incline to the lesser evil, to the cabal. And the working class will find a way to prevent Spain being made subject to an international agreement, like Tangiers, Danzig, or the Tsar. Victory or death, comrades. That is the choice at the present moment. Collaboration and Class Struggle In Spain, as has generally been the case in every country, the workers' movement has shown two tendencies. One, the collaborationist one, and the other, that admits no truck whatsoever with the enemy. In this country of ours, it has been socialism with its trade union offshoot, the UGT, that has played the classic role of reformists. It is a refuge for renegade workers, even of infiltrators into workers' organisations, whose sole purpose it is to yoke the proletariat to the cart of the bourgeoisie. The statements made by Indalecio Prieta during the Red Biennium on the occasion of the railway men's strike encapsulate the essence of the collaborationism. They are notorious. I am a minister first, and then a socialist, Don Inda stated then. The Spanish Revolution has suffered because of the reformists' pernicious influence on its direction. There has been no willingness to interpret the social class meaning of the July happenings. The class struggle that the CNT has always preached has been relegated to a secondary position by a series of issues that have been proved enormously prejudicial to the course of the revolutions. Noting this relegation, we must not only deplore this disfiguration of the revolution, but also, in organic terms, the ground lost through the failure to keep strictly to the line of revolution on a class terrain, and through having trampled revolutionary syndicalism into the ground. The unions are the organs that genuinely articulate the workers' class feeling in the eternal battle with capitalism. If we relegate the unions to a secondary position, it follows naturally that the interests of the proletariat will be prejudiced. Collaborationism is to be deplored at all times. There must be no collaboration with capitalism, whether outside the bourgeois state or from within the government itself. As producers, our place is in the unions, reinforcing the only bodies that ought to survive a revolution headed by the workers. Class struggle is no obstacle to workers continuing at present to fight on, the, on in the battlefields and working in the war industries. 
but it is imperative to keep it in mind that we proceed to each new initiative with a class sense, giving the unions the priority that is their due. There must be no other economic body outside the unions to restrict their powers, and the state cannot be retained in the face of the unions, let alone bolstered up by our own forces. The fight against capitalism goes on. Inside our own territory, there is still a bourgeoisie connected with the international bourgeoisie. The problem is now what it has been for years. Let us keep the unions true to themselves. Let us keep to the line mapped out by the CNT in its particular confrontation with our native bourgeoisie, as was always the norm up to 19th of July. Collaborationists are allies of the bourgeoisie. Individuals who advocate such relations have no feeling for the class struggle, nor have they had the slightest regard for the unions. Never must we accept the consolidation of our enemy's positions. The enemy must be restricted. If ever faced with a hiatus, we must never allow the social deviation to develop into a position of open assistance to capital. There can be absolutely no common ground between exploiters and exploited. Which shall prevail? Only battle can decide. Bourgeoisie or workers? Certainly not both of them at once. The working class holds the future in its hands. We pariahs have nothing to lose, and, on the contrary, we can win our emancipation, which is the destiny of the family of workers. Let us break the shackles. Let us strengthen our unions. Let us keep the spirit of class struggle alive. Our position. It is time to be specific. We shall be so, with respect to each of the problems posed by the present situation. With regard to the problem of the war, we back the idea of the army being under the absolute control of the working class. Officers with their origins in the capitalist regime do not deserve the slightest trust from us. Desertions have been numerous, and most of the disasters we have encountered can be laid down to obvious betrayals by officers. As to the army, we want a revolutionary one, led exclusively by workers, and, should any officer be retained, it must be under the strictest supervision. We insist that the war be directed by the workers. We have ground aplenty for this. The defeats at Toledo, Talavera, the loss of the North and Malaga, point to incompetence and lack of integrity in the government circles for the following reasons. The north of Spain could have been saved if the war materials needed for resistance to the enemy had been obtained. The means were there. The Bank of Spain had enough gold to flood Spanish soil with weaponry. Why was it not done? There was time. We must remember that the non-intervention controls did not begin to make their presence felt until the war in Spain was already some months old. Leadership in the conduct of the war has been disastrous. Lago Caballero's record is lamentable. That the Aragon Front has not been given the arms it so needs is his fault. His reluctance to arm the Aragonese sector has prevented Aragon from assuring her own redemption from the clutches of the fascists. At the same time, this could have taken the pressure of the fronts around Madrid and the north. And it was Largo Caballero who expressed the sentiment that sending arms to the Aragon front was like handing them over to the CNT. We are opposed to collaboration with bourgeois groups. We do not believe that the class approach can be abandoned. Revolutionary workers must not shoulder official posts, nor establish themselves in the ministries. For as long as the war lasts, collaboration is permissible. On the battlefield, in the trenches, on the parapets, and in the productive labour in the rearguard. Our place is in the unions, in the workplace, keeping alive that spirit of rebellion which will bloom on the earliest occasion that presents itself. We must have no part of combinations devised by bourgeois politicians acting in concert with foreign chancelleries. That would be tantamount to strengthening our enemies and tightening the noose of capitalism. No more portfolios. No more ministries. Let's go back to the unions and the nitty-gritty of work tools. Let us campaign for unity among the proletariat, but on the understanding that this unity must be between workers and not with bureaucrats or sinecurists. At present, an agreement with the revolutionary wing of the UGT by the CNT 
is a feasible prospect. But we do not believe that an understanding is possible with the UKT of Catalonia or with Prieto's followers. Socialization of the economy is crucial to victory in the war and progress in the revolution. The present drift cannot continue, nor should anyone believe there is any advantage in the various centers of production operating to no coordinated pattern. But it has to be the workers who see that this is done. Nor should the business about religion come up for further discussion. The people have already delivered its final verdict on that issue. Nonetheless, a tendency aimed at reopening the churches has emerged. Implementation of the law of freedom of worship and celebration of masses lead us to the conclusion that those in government have forgotten the days of the great burnings. There must be strict rationing in the distribution of goods. That workers should go hungry while hoarders find food in restaurants controlled by the working class is intolerable. Distribution must be socialized and accompanied by rationing. Bureaucracy must go. The thousands of bureaucrats who have descended on Barcelona are one of the worst plagues ever visited on us. In place of a bureaucrat, there ought to be a worker, and by bureaucrat, we mean any cafe layabout. Absolute suppression of the bureaucracy. Fabulous rates of pay must go immediately. It is scandalous that where militiamen are earning 10 pesetas a day, the bureaucrats are taking home such huge wages. Azania and Companis are still drawing the same salary as before. We want to see the introduction of the family wage, and an end, once and for all, to this galling inequality. It must be the people who administer justice. We cannot countenance the false practice that has grown up in this regard. There has been a drift away from the early class tribunals to courts made up of career magistrates, and we are going back to the way things used to be. Now, they are doing away with the juries. Proletarian justice belongs to the workers only. There must be progress towards socialization of the farming industry in Spain. The sabotaging of the collectives has harmed agriculture enormously and has favored speculation. Contact between town and countryside will bring the peasants closer to the proletarian class, and the mentality of the farm worker used to telling his own particularly plot will be changed. Like any other activity in the country that falls under the heading social, cultural, or economic, cultural problems are the indisputable province of the workers. It was they who set the pattern of this new era. Revolutionary order will be enforced by the workers. We insist that the uniformed corps, which are no guarantee for revolution, be dissolved. The unions must supply the men whose task it is to guard the new order we wish to implement. As to foreign policy, we shall accept no armistice, and, when it comes to propagandizing our revolution, we are of the view that that work must be done among the production centers abroad, not in any chancelleries, let alone any cabals. We must speak to the workers abroad in the language of revolution. So far the vocabulary of democracy has been employed. It has to be brought home to the workers' organizations, to everyone, that they must act, to sabotage fascist production, to refuse to load raw materials or war materials for the assassins of the Spanish people, and that they must demonstrate in the streets to demand fair treatment by their governments for the cause we defend, which is the cause of the world's proletariat. Our program. Revolutions cannot succeed if they have no guiding lights, no immediate objectives. That is what we find lacking in the July Revolution. Although it had the strength, the CNT did not know how to mould and shape the activity that arose spontaneously in the street. The very leadership was startled by events which were, as far as they were concerned, totally unexpected. They had no idea which course of action to pursue. There was no theory. Year after year we had spent speculating around abstractions. What is to be done? the leaders were asking themselves then, and they allowed the revolution to be lost. Such exalted moments leave no time for hesitancy. Rather, one must know where one is headed. This is precisely the vacuum we seek to fill, 
since we feel that what happened in July and May must never happen again. We are introducing a slight variation in anarchism to our program, the establishment of a revolutionary junta. As we see it, the revolution needs organisms to oversee it, and repress, in an organized sense, hostile sectors. As current events have shown, such sectors do not accept oblivion unless they are crushed. There may be anarchist comrades who feel certain ideological misgivings, but the lesson of experience is enough to induce us to stop pussyfooting. Unless we want a repetition of what is happening with the present revolution, we must proceed with the utmost energy against those who are not identified with the working class. After this brief preamble, we shall now proceed to set out the items of our program. 1. Establishment of a Revolutionary Junta, or National Defence Council. This body will be organised as follows. Members of the Revolutionary Junta will be elected by democratic vote in the union organisations. Account is to be taken of the number of comrades away at the front. These comrades must have the right to representation. The junta will steer clear of economic affairs, which are the exclusive preserve of the unions. The functions of the revolutionary junta are as follows. A. The management of the war. B. The supervision of revolutionary order. C. International affairs. D. Revolutionary propaganda. Posts to come up regularly for reallocation so as to prevent anyone growing attached to them. And the trade union assemblies will exercise control over the junta's activities. 2. All economic power to the syndicates. Since July, the unions have supplied evidence of the great capacity for constructive labour. Had we not relegated them to a secondary position, they would have yielded a great return on the investment. It will be the unions that structure the proletarian economy. An economic council may also be set up, taking into consideration the natures of the industrial unions and the industrial federations, to improve on the coordination of economic activities. 3. Free Municipality Prior to the coming of the foreign dynasties, municipal rights were defended with great tenacity in Spain. Such decentralization precluded the, the erection of a new state system. And in this new Spain, which the proletariat looks forward to, the Charter of Freedoms that went under Villalar shall rise again, and the so-called Catalan and Basque problems will be resolved. The municipality shall take charge of those functions of society that fall outside the preserve of the unions, and since the society we are going to build shall be composed exclusively of producers, it will be the unions no less that will provide sustenance for the municipalities. And, as there is no disparity of interests, there can be no conflict. The municipalities will be organised at the level of local, comarcal, and peninsular federations. Unions and municipalities will maintain a liaison at local, comarcal, and national levels. Towards a fresh revolution. The demise of the July Revolution has been rapid. None of the revolutions generally regarded as the archetypes of social revolution experience such a giddy decline. There can be no theorizing about events following one another in stages, because revolution is not yet a fact. It is imperative that the inexhaustive genius of proletarian Spain be tapped once again. We must go out and make a new beginning. Revolutions occur with great frequency in our country. Sometimes they are embarked upon without the requisite conditions being present, and with no possibility of success. One has to be able to divine the precise moment, psychologically and insurrectionally speaking. The outcome hangs on the correct choice. Making forecasts is no easy task. Who can say when a new July or even a new May may be possible? We may assume, however, that in Spain, the conditions will present themselves afresh. If the war continues to take this unfavourable turn, all the politicians looking for a way to arrive at an armistice and a fraternal embrace will have to be cast on the dung heap. Good evidence of this is the sabotaging of the war, the war industries and the whole gamut of supplies, as well as the inflated prices of food. An inflation fomented by those in power, with an eye to creating a favourable atmosphere in which to execute their plans for strangling the revolution. 
It may, perhaps, be that a negotiated settlement becomes a reality. Then the time will have come to resist it by force of arms. And should we win the war, those problems that are posed in such poignant form today will be roused again on the return of our comrades from the fronts. What solutions will be found to them? How will the industry of war be converted into an industry of peace? Will there be work for the fighting men? Will all the victims be looked after? Will the officer class resign itself to the loss of its sinecures? Can markets be won back again? The three dates we have described each correspond to different positions. We cannot say which will apply. The problem, however, hinges on the preparation of a new rebellion, so that the proletariat can assume control of the country in a definite way. They cannot say we are overreacting. The present moment has nothing revolutionary about it. The counter-revolution feels quite bold enough to mount all sorts of provocations. The jails are crammed with workers. The rights of the proletariat are openly denied. We revolutionary workers are treated like underlings. The language of the bureaucrats, in uniform and out of uniform, is intolerable. Not to mention the attacks on the unions. A fresh revolution is the only course of action open. Let us set about its preparation. And at the height of a new stroke, we shall join the comrades who are today away fighting on the fronts. The comrades in the jails, and the comrades who, even now, cherish the hope of a revolution that may bring justice to the working class. All in the streets, together. To the success of a fresh revolution that will bring the workers of town and country complete satisfaction. To the attainment of an anarchist society that will satisfy man's aspirations. Forward, comrades! This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.